Welcome! In this video, I'll be covering natural deduction, which is a formal proof system that roughly follows the rules for proofs I introduced in the previous video on informal proof theory. Before getting started, I'd like to situate this video a bit, so remember the distinction I drew between syntax and semantics in the introductory video on mathematical logic. So syntax is basically everything that has to do with the formal structures in our logic. For instance, how we define the language of our logic, so what our well-formed formulas will be a syntactic notion, and also what we accept as a proof will also be a syntactic notion. On the other hand, on the semantic side, we'll have notions like logical validity, which captures the idea of a formula being true, and this will somehow have to do with the meaning of the formula in question. Now in this video, we'll be concerned with the syntactic notion of proof, so I'll be presenting a formal proof system that tells us exactly what a proof is and what rules it needs to follow, but the proof system won't actually make any reference to what the formulas it's processing mean. In other words, proofs are just sort of syntactic structures that need to follow certain requirements, and then they count as a valid proof, and we'll be writing things like gamma entails phi to say that the formula phi follows from a set of formulas gamma. But again, this type of relationship here is established through purely mechanical manipulation of the formulas. On the other hand, later on, we'll look at semantics, and we'll have a similar looking notion of gamma models phi, so here we use this double turnstile symbol instead, which will actually make reference to like the meaning of the formulas in question. So we'll be interpreting formulas and seeing how their truth values somehow relate to one another. Now, of course, the idea behind designing a good proof system is to have one in which this purely mechanical proving of formulas will actually produce logically valid formulas. And conversely, given logically valid formulas, ideally we would like to prove them in our proof system. So going in this direction, we have the notion of being a sound proof system, which says that whatever formulas you can actually prove in your proof system turn out to be logically valid. And then in the other direction, we have this idea of being a complete proof system, which says that whenever you're given a logically valid formula, you can actually find a proof that derives it. Now in this video, we'll squarely be in the syntax side of this diagram here. So I'll be introducing this formal proof system called natural deduction. But in fact, it turns out that natural deduction is sound and complete for propositional logic. It's also sound and complete for first order logic if you additionally add some rules for quantifiers, which I'm not going to show in this video. So that hopefully tells you why natural deduction is worth learning. Well, because the formulas you can derive using it are actually uh, logically valid. And also, well, in principle, you could derive any sort of logical valid formula in it. But for this video, I'll just be presenting the system and it'll just be presented as sort of a set of arbitrary rules. Now, if you want some intuition for why the rules make sense, you should go back to the video on informal proof theory because the rules are essentially the same. I won't be talking too much about the intuition um, here in this video. I will, however, give you ample opportunity to practice using natural deduction. So after each uh, set of rules that I introduce, I'll be giving you a set of exercises which you can do if you want to actually learn how to write natural deduction proofs. All right, so let's get started with our first definition, which is that of a derivation. So the formal proofs we'll be constructing using natural deductions will be called derivations. And a derivation of some statement phi is, well, it's a formal proof that takes the form of a tree. So I'll uh, give you an example in a moment to show you exactly what that means. So it takes the form of a tree whose leaves contain all of the assumptions that we use in the proof. And moreover, the root of that tree is the formula phi that we're trying to prove. And finally, we want that every node in the tree follows some natural deduction rule. So here it's just easiest to give you an example of what a derivation looks like. So here is an example of a derivation. Basically, a derivation is like a set of applications of natural deduction rules which are indicated by these horizontal lines here. And we always write the name of the rule um, to the right of the line. 
In this case, we're using the same rule twice, namely the introduction rule for conjunction. So maybe let's look at this part of the derivation first. So here we have two assumptions, namely phi and psi. And well, we're now using this introduction rule for the conjunction to derive the formula phi and psi from these two assumptions. And then in the next step, we're applying the same rule to the formula phi and psi, and also this new formula chi to get the formula phi and psi and chi, like so. Now the things I'm underlining, so phi, psi, and chi, these are our assumptions that we're using in the derivation. And the reason they're assumptions is because they're sort of on the highest level up. So there's nothing leading to these formulas. On the other hand, the formula down here, this is the conclusion of the derivation, and that's the formula that this derivation proves. Okay, so let's compare this example here again with the definition above. So the definition says a derivation of a statement phi is a formal proof in the form of a tree whose leaves contain its assumptions and whose root is the formula in question phi. So this derivation here at first glance might not look like a tree, but uh, basically you can imagine it as a tree as follows. So these assumptions here are the leaves of the tree. And then whenever you apply a rule, you, you branch out. Okay, so this derivation here could be viewed as the tree that I've highlighted. And then indeed the leaves of that tree are the assumptions that I've indicated, whereas the root is the conclusion. And so we would say that this example here is a derivation of this formula down here. Okay, and moreover, each node in the tree, so each time we branch, we have to follow some natural deduction rule. And well, the rules um, are indicated here on the right of these horizontal lines. Okay, so this notion of derivation here will be our formal notion of proof for natural deduction. And basically, whenever we can write down a derivation that has a certain formula as the conclusion, given some assumptions, then we say that we've proved the conclusion based on these assumptions. This notion of proving a certain conclusion from a set of assumptions will now be defined more formally in the form of a sequent. So a sequent is an expression of the following form. So it's just this expression here. So we pronounce this gamma entails psi. And here psi is a statement, so it's just like a formula that we call the conclusion of the sequent, whereas gamma is a set of statements, which can also be empty, and we call these the assumptions of the sequent. Okay, so that explains what this expression here means. Now, what does it mean? Well, we say a sequent is correct if the following holds here. Namely, there is a derivation of this formula psi whose assumptions are all contained in the set gamma. In other words, what a correct sequent of this form is expressing is that we can write down a derivation of this formula psi using only assumptions that occur in gamma. So gamma might contain more assumptions than we actually need, but all the assumptions that we do need, in fact, need to lie in gamma. Okay, so to make this less confusing, let's give an example. So I've written down the derivation we had previously for this formula here. So remember that in this derivation, this formula is the conclusion of the derivation, whereas these three formulas up here are the assumptions. We can now write down what this derivation proves in the form of a sequent. So the assumptions we have are phi, psi, and chi. And together, these three assumptions entail the formula phi and psi and chi. So that's the conclusion we had for our uh, derivation. Okay, so here these are our assumptions gamma, whereas this over here is our conclusion, which in the general notation above we were calling psi, but uh, I'm using psi here, so I'll just leave it at that. Okay, so sequence are somehow a shorthand way of writing down 
what sort of derivations exist. So if you want, you can mentally rotate the sequence like by 90 degrees. And well, these assumptions are precisely what's on top of the derivation here, well, the conclusion is what's on the bottom. So somehow the sequent is an abbreviation for this entire derivation. So whenever the sequent is correct, we're saying that there exists a derivation that uses only the assumptions here and manages to prove the conclusion using our natural deduction calculus. So sequents express provability in general, but they kind of get rid of all of the details we needed in order to prove a certain statement. Now, a fine point here is that gamma doesn't need to be exactly the assumptions you're using in your derivation. So this sequence is correct, if we look at the definition again, if there is a derivation of your conclusion whose assumptions are all contained in gamma. So in this case, this is true because we have a derivation here and our assumptions are exactly the set gamma. But in principle, the sequent would still be correct if we added additional assumptions to the set gamma here. So for instance, I could, let's say, add another formula uh, in here. So let's say I add theta as an additional assumption. And then this sequent would still be correct because this derivation here, well, validates the sequent because it is a derivation of the conclusion. So it's the same conclusion where all of the assumptions we're using in the derivation occur in gamma. Now we're not using this additional assumption theta, but that doesn't uh, affect the correctness of the sequent. So the way to think about this is that, well, if you make additional assumptions, well, then you can still prove your conclusion. You're just not using these additional assumptions. Okay, so we've introduced the two core definitions that we'll be using for this video. We've introduced the definition of a derivation which is the formal proof object we'll be working with. And basically you get a derivation by applying natural deduction rules to certain sets of assumptions. And now most of the rest of the video will be explaining exactly what those rules are. Um, but as sort of a preview, they'll roughly align with the proof rules I gave in the previous video on informal proof theory. Then parallel to this notion of derivation, we have this idea of sequence which somehow summarizes what types of things we can prove. So a sequent kind of summarizes a specific derivation, and we say that a sequent is correct if there exists a derivation that has assumptions that occur in this uh, set of assumptions gamma and actually proves the conclusion. Therefore, parallel to the rules for the natural deduction derivations, there'll also be certain rules for how to manipulate sequence. So whenever we introduce a new rule for derivations that allows us to somehow produce new proofs from old ones and therefore we can also well get new correct sequence from old correct sequence because sequence somehow just summarize the types of proofs we can obtain. If this seems very confusing at the moment don't worry about it. Basically talking about these concepts in the abstract is probably not the best way to learn about them but it's necessary in order to lay the foundations for what we're about to see. Once I start introducing the rules in question, everything will become very concrete, and I hope that this will clear up any confusion. We now turn to the first and perhaps most fundamental natural deduction rule, which is called the axiom rule. So it says that for any statement phi whatsoever, we can construct a derivation which just consists of phi itself. So this derivation has conclusion phi and its only assumption is also phi. So if we think about this as a tree, it just consists of a single node, which is at the same time its root and a leaf. Okay, so what the axiom rule is essentially allowing us to do is it's allowing us to prove any formula based on the assumption of that formula. So this isn't very interesting, but it provides a starting point for building more complicated derivations. Now, as I mentioned before, for each natural deduction rule will have a corresponding rule telling us how we can get new correct sequence from old ones based on that rule. So here the sequent rule for axiom states that if we have some formula psi occurring in the set gamma, then in fact the sequent gamma entails psi is correct. Why is this? Well, remember from the definition that correctness of the sequent means that there exists a derivation of the formula psi 
based only on assumptions occurring in the set gamma. Okay, but what would one such derivation be? Well, one such derivation would just be the derivation of psi using the axiom natural deduction rule. So this is a derivation of psi using only the assumption psi, which is indeed a subset of this set gamma by assumption. Okay, so this already gives us a large class of correct sequence. So whenever the conclusion of the sequent directly occurs as an assumption of the sequent, well then that sequent is correct. Now there's a second sequent rule, which is more complicated, which doesn't directly follow from axiom, but rather follows from sort of the structure of our derivations. It says that if we have a correct sequent of the form delta entails psi, and moreover, for every element small delta occurring in this set delta, we have a correct sequent that gamma entails this small delta, then in fact the assumptions in gamma are sufficient to prove um, psi. So first let's understand the structure of this rule. So it's a form of transitivity because we start with this sequent here. So this is something that's kind of going from gamma to delta. Then we have something like this where we are going from delta to psi and we conclude something going from gamma to psi. Okay, so why is this sequent rule correct? Well, it follows from like gluing different derivations together. So the assumption here that the sequent delta to psi is correct means that we have some proof of the formula um, psi based on the set of assumptions delta. Okay, so there exists some derivation that starts with assumptions occurring in delta and then proves the formula psi. And then moreover, our additional assumption is that for every formula occurring in the set of assumptions delta, we also have that this sequent here is correct. So that gamma entails delta. All right, so for each small delta being an assumption in this set capital delta, we in fact also have a derivation of small delta from the set of assumptions gamma. And moreover, this holds for any element um, in the set capital delta, so we can prove that statement from the assumptions gamma. And so now you see here what's happening, so I can somehow glue together these derivations, so I can basically prove any one of these assumptions in the set capital delta from the assumptions in gamma, and hence overall what I get if I look at this entire structure here is a derivation of the formula of psi using only assumptions occurring in the set capital gamma. Or if you want to think about this more formally, well this thing is like a tree whose leaves are all elements in the set capital delta. And then we have these derivations which are also trees that have root uh, small delta for each small delta occurring in this set. Well, then we can just glue these types of trees to the corresponding leaves of this tree, and we get a bigger tree whose leaves only contain elements occurring in the set capital gamma. And well, each node is still a valid natural deduction rule because each node here was a natural deduction rule, and each node occurring here also was a natural deduction rule, and so on. And therefore, this entire thing is a derivation, well, of psi from these assumptions up here. Okay, so these are some important so-called structural rules for our logic. And in fact, we would want these types of structural rules to hold for pretty much any type of logic we would define. So in this sense, they are still very general and abstract, so they're not really telling us much about natural deduction. The first rule that, in fact, will give us some information on what natural deduction is actually about will be the introduction rule for conjunction. So that's the rule that we saw in the example in the beginning of the video, and here I'll tell you exactly how it works. So the introduction rule for conjunction, and it's abbreviated like this, so we always write like the, the logical connective symbol first, and then we write either I or E for introduction or elimination rule. And now usually these rules will have the following form. We'll be taking some existing derivations, and then we'll be somehow combining these derivations into a larger derivation. 
So Axiom allows us to kind of create new derivations by just proving a formula from itself. But then all of the other rules are basically using existing derivations that we've constructed to make some more complicated derivations. Concretely, the introduction rule for conjunction says that if we're given two derivations like this, we can combine them into a larger derivation like this. So here I need to explain the notation a bit. So I'm going to write like d for derivation. So d is the derivation d and d prime is a second derivation called d prime. And then above the d, I'm going to put all of the assumptions that go into the derivation. And on the bottom of the d, I'm going to write the conclusion of the derivation. So here, this derivation is a derivation whose assumptions are in the set gamma and which proves this uh, formula phi. And the second derivation here is called d prime and its assumptions are in the set delta and it proves the formula of psi. Now what the introduction rule for conjunction allows us to do is combine these in the following way. So I can put these individual derivations like so next to one another and then based on both of these, so this one proves phi and this one proves psi, well together, taken together, both of these derivations uh, prove the formula phi and psi. And that's what the uh, introduction rule for conjunction does. So basically it allows us to take two separate derivations that we've previously established and then combine them to prove the conjunction of both of the conclusions. Okay, so this new derivation has conclusion this formula here, so this conjunction, and the assumptions for this new derivation are the assumptions of our two original derivations combined. So here we had assumptions capital gamma and here we have assumptions capital delta. And now the assumptions for this new derivation are the union of these assumptions. So we have uh, capital gamma union capital delta. Okay, so that's the natural deduction rule. So why does it make sense? Well, let's think back to the introduction rule for conjunction in our informal proof theory. So there we said in order to prove a statement of the form phi and psi, we have to prove both phi and also psi. So this is exactly what this rule is doing. It's taking two proofs and combining them into a single proof of the conjunction. The sequent rule corresponding to this natural deduction rule above is the following. So it says that if the sequent gamma entails phi is correct and also delta entails psi is correct, then in fact we also have a correct sequent of the following form, namely gamma union delta entails phi and psi. So you can see here from the natural deduction rule exactly where that's coming from. So if we can prove phi from the set capital gamma and we can prove psi from the set capital delta, well then this rule is telling us that we can prove this conjunction from the union of these two uh, sets of assumptions. Now again there's some subtlety going on here with the definitions because here when I write gamma and delta, I mean that this is in fact like the complete set of all the assumptions we're using in the derivation. Whereas when gamma and delta occur here, it just means that there exists a derivation that uses a subset of, of these assumptions to establish the conclusion. So somehow these sets here could be larger than the actual assumptions you really need in the derivation, but this conclusion will still hold if you like put additional assumptions in there. I mean, if you add additional assumptions, you can still prove everything you can if you had the fewer assumptions. But just to clarify, when I write gamma and delta here in the derivations, I mean that this is in fact a complete set of all assumptions. So I've now introduced you to two natural deduction rules, and in fact this is already enough to start writing down some derivations. So the following exercise gives you three sequence which you can try to show. Since we only have axiom and the uh, conjunction introduction um, rule, basically we can only prove like statements which are conjunctions of other statements. So if you want to get some practice with these rules, I suggest you try to prove at least one of these on your own. Since it might not be entirely clear for you yet how to go about this, I'll give you a hint by partially solving one of these exercises. So I'll call this B prime. So the thing I'm going to show is that the set uh, phi entails the formula phi conjoined with phi. 
Remember that to show that the sequence is correct, we have to come up with some natural deduction derivation of this formula here based only on assumptions occurring in this set. So here, the only assumption we're allowed to use in our derivation is the formula phi itself. Okay, so how do I go about this? So, well, I don't really have any other place to start aside from using the axiom rule. So first I can use axiom to derive phi from itself. Okay, and I can do this twice. So I can apply axiom again separately to get a second derivation, which is again a derivation of phi using itself as an assumption. So individually, these two things are derivations. And now I can combine them using the introduction rule for conjunction. So by using uh, conjunction introduction, I now combine both of these derivations into a new derivation of the conjunction of the conclusions of the original derivation. Okay, and this precisely gives me the formula that I want to show for the sequent. So I hope it's clear that individually these two uh, things are valid derivations based on the axiom rule. Maybe it's less clear why I can combine them in this way using the conjunction introduction. So recall that conjunction introduction took something of the form uh, derivation from gamma to phi, and then some derivation of uh, psi based on assumptions in delta, and combined them like this to a derivation of the formula phi and psi. Okay, so that's what the general rule looks like. Now here I've instantiated in the following way. So in my case, um, the set gamma here is actually just um, phi, so it just contains a single assumption phi, Delta is equal to gamma and is also just the set containing phi. And moreover here, psi is equal to phi. And so basically now, well, because psi is equal to phi, if you plug everything in, you get the thing I wrote up here. So it might be a bit confusing because this is a sort of very simple case of this more general rule. But uh, basically the introduction rule is just saying you can plug two existing derivations like side by side and you get a derivation of the of the conjunction. All right, so I hope that based on this hint, you can try um, yourself to solve these exercises here to get some practice and maybe start internalizing a bit how this system works. We'll next move on to the second rule for conjunction, which is the elimination rule. So suppose we have a derivation of this uh, conjunction here, phi and psi, based on the assumptions gamma. So if this is a derivation, then we get to eliminate the conjunction here in two different ways. So either we can eliminate the second conjunct to get a new derivation that looks like this. So here we plug in our existing derivation, like on top of this horizontal line, and then we just forget about the second conjunct. So whenever we have some derivation of uh, phi and psi based on some assumptions gamma, well then we can forget about the second conjunct and make this into a derivation of just the formula phi based on the same assumptions gamma. Or alternatively, we can forget the first conjunct, like so, and get a derivation of psi based on the same assumptions gamma. Okay, so let's think briefly about why this rule makes sense in the context of those proof rules I presented in the previous video. So here we're saying that, well, we already have a proof of phi and psi, and these rules are now saying that we can convert this proof of phi and psi into two other proofs, namely we can make this proof into a proof of just phi, and also we can make it into a proof of just psi. So what this is saying essentially is that if we have proved the statement phi and psi, then in particular we've also proved phi based on the assumptions we used, and moreover we also proved psi based on those assumptions. Okay, so here's the corresponding sequent rule for conjunction elimination. So it's saying that if this sequent is correct, so if we can prove this conclusion, the conjunction phi and psi based on assumptions occurring in the set capital gamma, then also the following two sequents are correct, namely we can prove just phi based on assumptions in the set capital gamma, and also we can prove psi based on assumptions in the set capital gamma. The reason this holds is because of this rule above. So if this sequence is correct, well then there exists a proof of this form, and well then we can apply the rule to get, well, both proofs of this 
uh, statement phi here based on assumptions gamma and also a proof of uh, phi based on the assumptions gamma. So that's why these two sequence then automatically become correct. All right, let's now see an example which uses all of the rules that we've seen so far. So this example asks us to show that this sequence here is correct. Now what is this sequence saying? So it's saying that we're allowed to assume this single formula here, namely phi and psi, and what we want to prove is uh, psi and phi. So the order is reversed. So essentially this is expressing the commutativity of the conjunction. Okay, so now this case is simple enough that we might more or less directly manage to think of the right uh, way to proceed. So here, because I just have a single assumption, um, well, a good place to start would be writing down that assumption using axiom. And now, well, there's not really any place to go aside from using this elimination rule for the conjunction. So I now need to decide which of the two conjuncts I want to eliminate. And I now look at the, the formula I'm trying to prove. So here we have psi occurring on the left and phi occurring on the right. So it's probably going to be a wise choice to have psi be the conclusion of this elimination rule. So here I do and elimination to get psi. And well, in a similar manner, I can start again with phi and psi using axiom. But here I can eliminate um, the second conjunct to get phi. Okay, so individually, these two things are again derivations. And I now can plug them uh, together, put them next to one another using the introduction rule for conjunction. And this gives me a derivation of the formula psi and phi. Okay, so this is now a derivation of this conclusion, which I wanted based on only assumptions that occur in the set, namely the only assumption we're making is uh, phi and psi. And that proves that this sequence here is correct. Now in this case, the derivation was sufficiently simple that with like some playing around with the things, you can probably more or less directly write down from start to finish this derivation. But in more complicated examples, that probably won't be possible. So some helpful tips for how to come up with derivations are, well, the first tip is to not try to start from the top and go downwards, but rather start with the formula you're trying to prove and then somehow work upwards. Another thing that's useful is kind of to think about like individual parts of these derivations. So because these rules kind of combine different derivations into new ones, you can kind of think of these parts as like lemmas and maybe you can establish certain things which look like they could be useful later in a larger derivation by just kind of playing around with the assumptions you have. Now, another thing that's worth noting is that this is not the only derivation which you could come up with that proves the sequent. For instance, consider the following derivation. So I start again with my assumption. I now uh, eliminate, uh, in this case, I eliminate psi to get phi. And now separately, I also start with this assumption. And in this case, I eliminate phi to get psi. And now I kind of plug it back together again using the introduction rule. And this gives me phi and psi, okay? So this derivation here is sort of a stupid derivation which derives the conclusion phi and psi based on the assumptions phi and psi in a complicated way. So first I eliminate uh, the conjunction and then I introduce it again. But you can see that because I have this sort of trivial derivation here, I could in principle plug in this derivation like to the, the top of let's say this derivation and that would give me a larger derivation which also proves the uh, desired conclusion here based on the same assumptions. All right, so in general, there are many derivations that correspond to a correct sequent. I mean, this makes sense in math also when you're trying to prove a statement, there are in principle many different possible proofs of the same statement. Now, of course, in this case, the original derivation I gave is clearly better than this derivation that includes this sort of detour, which is unnecessary. But in other cases, there might be two derivations that sort of aren't comparable in this way. So where one isn't just like a trivial extension of another one. 
And this is in fact an interesting question, like the question of like how many different proofs can you find for a specific statement based on given assumptions. And here different means that we kind of want to exclude these cases where we're just like introducing certain things and then eliminating them again. So in that case, you would want to define some notion of equivalence on proofs that ignores these types of, uh, well, trivial introduction and elimination steps. The final thing I want to note is that in fact, we could have also established the sequent here using purely the sequent rules. Okay, how would we go about that? Well, first we use the um, axiom rule for sequence to say that in fact, uh, the conjunction here, phi and psi entails, well, itself, phi and psi. So this is a correct sequent by the axiom sequent rule we saw earlier. Okay, but now in the second step, I can use the sequent rule for conjunction elimination to get the following two correct sequents. So I have that phi and psi entails separately phi, and also that well, phi and psi here entails psi. So here these two things are taken together, okay? So, okay, so this is an axiom sequent rule. And then here we're using the sequent rule for conjunction elimination. Okay, and now I want to put these two correct sequents back together again. And that in fact makes use of the sequent rule for uh, conjunction introduction. So remember that that one said that whenever we have two sequents that are correct, we can combine them. And the way we combine them is that the conclusion of the combined sequent is the conjunction of the individual conclusions, whereas we need to union together the assumptions. However, in this case, because the set of assumptions are the same, the union of these two sets will also just be, well, this set again. So if we apply the rule for uh, conjunction introduction, we get that phi and psi um, entails, and now we need to kind of do this in the right order. So we want to get the other order here. And so we would have to kind of, before applying this rule, we would have to rearrange the order of these two sequences. But basically in language, the term and doesn't really have a fixed ordering and that's what we're exploiting here. That if this holds, so this is correct and this is correct, well then also this is correct and this is correct. Okay, so instead of using, well, our natural deduction rules, we could have also shown the sequent using purely these sequent rules. And if you compare, you see the steps that we're doing are basically the same. So here in our derivation, we're first using axiom, then we're using this uh, elimination rule and then the introduction rule, and the same is happening for the sequent rules. The difference here is that this is constructing a specific derivation or a specific proof, whereas this is sort of a higher level argument where we're arguing about provability in general. So the sequent rules are somehow saying, for example here, if we have a proof that has this form, then we also have proofs of this form. But we're not saying specifically how those proofs look. So while these two arguments here look like they're very similar, this one on the right is in fact arguing about provability in general, whereas this one is providing a specific example of a proof. Which one of these is better will depend on the context, but uh, for the moment we're most interested in actually constructing explicit natural deduction proofs. In fact, it's possible to build up a logical system based purely on sequent rules. So that's like a more high level perspective where you're kind of stating what type of things should be provable and or not. And you're not really going into the details about like actually defining a proof system in which those things become provable. Here, on the other hand, we're taking a more concrete sort of perspective where we're saying exactly what proofs consist of, and we're saying how we can build up proofs from old ones, and that then entails certain things about provability in our system, which is captured by these sequent rules. In other words, in our system here, these sequent rules are a provable consequence of our natural deduction rules, and they don't just serve as definitions as they would in the case where you would like build up your logical system based on them. All right, now that we've seen the elimination rule for conjunction, we can start proving some more interesting sequence about conjunction. So that's the content of the following exercises. So the first exercise asks you to prove these three sequence here.
which again will just involve axiom, the introduction and elimination rules for conjunction. So if you want to get some practice with these rules, I would recommend doing at least one or two of these exercises. And then the second exercise is a bit more conceptual. So it asks you to show that this sequence here is correct so that we can prove a formula uh, psi based on the assumptions phi1 and phi2 if and only if this sequence over here is correct, namely that we can prove the same formula of psi based on the conjunction of phi1 and phi2. So in order to solve this, you need to show that if this sequence is correct, then also this sequence is correct, and conversely. Essentially what this is saying is that putting commas between your assumptions here is equivalent to combining your assumptions using conjunction. So in principle, we wouldn't actually have to allow for a set of assumptions. We could reduce to the case where our assumptions are just contained in a single formula where the individual assumptions are combined using conjunction. If you do the exercise, you'll see that essentially if you have this situation where things are kind of packed together in a conjunction, you can unpack them using one of the rules, and that'll give you basically all of the assumptions individually. On the other hand, having this set of assumptions is nicer because you don't have to perform this unpacking step at the beginning of each proof. But for theoretical reasons, it's nice to know this because essentially you can always restrict to the case where you actually just have one formula in your assumptions. We're now ready to turn to our second connective, namely implication. Here in the introduction rule, we'll see a new feature that occurs in natural deduction rules, which is that sometimes we can change our set of assumptions using a rule. Okay, so what does this rule say? It says that if we have a derivation, d, of the formula psi based on the assumptions gamma, so if this is a derivation, then so are the following derivations. So let's have a look at this one here. So this is saying that if we have this derivation of psi based on the assumptions gamma, then we are able to conclude that phi implies psi for any other uh, statement phi. And moreover, we're also allowed to remove that statement from our assumptions. So basically there's two things happening here. On the one hand, we're introducing this connective, the implication here, with a new uh, statement phi as our premises, but also we're allowed to remove this statement phi from our assumptions. On the other hand, removing this uh, assumption is optional. So in fact, this is what the second rule is saying. We can just leave the derivation as is, and if we manage to prove psi based on our assumptions gamma, well then also we can prove phi implies psi based on our assumptions gamma. However, this application of the introduction rule is weaker because, well, in contrast to the case on the left, we're not removing this additional assumption even though we in principle would be allowed to. Okay, so why does this rule make sense? Well, this rule is mirroring the introduction rule for implication in the informal proof calculus I talked about in the last video. Remember that there, in order to prove an implication, we first assumed the hypothesis of the implication and then proved the conclusions. So what you have to imagine here is that this derivation here is assuming phi, and together with some additional assumptions, it's proving the statement psi. And now what this rule here is saying is that, well, if we manage to prove psi based on phi with some additional assumptions, then in fact, we've proved the implication phi implies psi, but we get to get rid of this temporary assumption phi we made in order to derive psi. A particularly simple case of this rule would be the following. So suppose I have a proof of psi based on the single assumption phi, so in an informal proof, I would say, suppose phi, and then I perform a proof, and I manage to derive the statement psi. Well, now the introduction rule here is telling me that, in fact, this allows me to conclude that phi implies psi. And in addition, if I want, I can remove this assumption phi from my derivation. In other words, if I manage to prove psi based on phi like this, then, in fact, I've proved this implication phi implies psi based on no assumptions. Here I'm noticing that I haven't been completely consistent with my bracketing, so whenever we introduce a connective, we surround the resulting expression with brackets in order to make sure that the order of application of the different connectives is completely unambiguous. <laughs>
Now, corresponding to the natural deduction rule I just presented, we also have the sequent rule. It says that if we have a correct sequent of this form, so we manage to prove psi based on the assumptions gamma together with the assumption phi, well then, also this sequent here is correct, that in fact the assumptions in gamma are sufficient to prove the implication that phi implies a psi. So somehow we've moved this assumption here across the turnstile and added this implication symbol. Now it turns out that this rule here also covers the case where we don't remove phi from our assumptions because it's possible that phi occurs as a second time in these assumptions gamma. So basically this is capturing two cases. In the first case, phi does not occur in gamma. And then, well, we've proved a uh, correct sequence here where we're no longer having phi as an assumption, but phi could also occur here in this set gamma. And then, well, phi is still occurring here in this set gamma. The reason we have a choice for removing our assumptions is basically, well, if we don't remove the assumptions, then we just have more assumptions. So we can prove the same thing as with fewer assumptions. So we're basically never forced to actually remove these assumptions if we don't want to. In particular, this includes the case if we're like uh, taking a formula phi here, which doesn't even occur in our assumptions, well, then we can also not remove it. But somehow not removing things is not optimal. So the statement that some statement implies psi is weaker than just the single statement psi. All right. So because this is sort of a new concept with removing these assumptions, I'm again going to do a detailed example. So what we're going to show is that this sequence here is correct. And here we're seeing for the first time the notation that happens when the set of assumptions gamma is empty. So in that case, we just remove gamma completely and just write everything to the right of the turnstile. So this is saying that we want to show that this formula here can be proved using a natural deduction derivation from no assumptions. Now for this example, I'm going to kind of show you how you would um, write down the derivation if you were trying to figure it out for yourself. So instead of going from top to bottom, I'm going to start from the bottom and go to the top. All right, so the conclusion we'll want in the end is the following formula, namely phi implies psi implies phi and psi, like so. And well, now we see that the main connective of this formula is the implication here. So Basically, the only way that we could have got this formula in the last step is if we use the introduction rule for implication. And in fact, we would be using the introduction rule on uh, this phi here. So the resulting formula that we would have had in the previous step would have been this one. And moreover, we could have gotten rid of this assumption phi while using this introduction rule. So despite the fact that I'm trying to prove something from no assumptions, I might have originally had the assumption phi somewhere, but just gotten rid of it in the last step. In fact, now I can sort of reverse this rule and get the assumption phi if I want it. Okay, now I look at this second formula here, and I see that again, the main connective is the implication. So the only way I could have gotten this formula is if I used the introduction rule for implication. And the formula that I apply the introduction rule to is this conjunction phi and psi. So here I'm using this introduction rule on this uh, formula psi here. So in principle, if I had wanted to, I could have also gotten rid of psi from my assumptions. So I'm going to add psi to my assumptions here because in this step I can get rid of it. And now we see that what remains here is exactly what we need because I now have two assumptions, namely phi and psi, and I can combine these using the introduction rule for conjunction to get this conjunction. So the last step here, the only possible rule I could apply to, well, get this conjunction is in fact the introduction rule for conjunction, which requires exactly these assumptions, which I'm allowed to get rid of in these uh, steps down here. So to make it clear which assumptions I'm getting rid of in which step, I'm going to number these occurrences of the introduction rule. And in the first application of this introduction rule for implication, I've gotten rid of um, psi as an assumption. And here in the second um, application, I've gotten rid of phi. This will be our notation for getting rid of assumptions. In the book I'm using, this is called discharging assumptions. 
So we're allowed to discharge these two assumptions and basically they no longer factor into our derivation, but they were there temporarily in order to establish certain things. So now that I've gotten rid of these assumptions, this derivation in fact uses no assumptions because the top line here is empty and I'm not using any additional assumptions anywhere else. And we see that the conclusion is exactly the formula that I wanted to establish here for this sequent. And therefore, this derivation here proves that this sequent is correct, namely that I can prove this uh, implication here from no assumptions. Now again, it would be possible to prove the same sequent using the sequent rules. I'll just briefly illustrate how you would do that. So again, it kind of parallels the, the derivation we have here. So first you would use an uh, axiom to show that, well, on the one hand, the set containing the formula phi entails phi, so that's axiom. Also the set containing psi entails psi, that's again axiom. Now I can combine both of these into the fact that the set containing psi and phi um, entails the conjunction phi and psi. So this is using the um, conjunction introduction sequent rule, which says that if you union together your assumptions, then you can prove the conjunction between the conclusions. Okay, and now in a second step, I'm going to use this introduction rule here for implication to move individual parts of the assumptions over to the conclusions while introducing implications. So first I look at this set and think of this as being a set gamma containing only phi union together with the singleton set containing psi. And well, then I can apply uh, this introduction rule here to get that uh, this singleton set containing phi, in fact, entails that psi implies that um, phi and psi hold like this. So that's an application of this rule. So I've moved one of the parts of my assumptions over uh, to the right, to the conclusions, but that's introduced an implication. Then I can apply this a second time. So here in this application, I'm taking this gamma here to be the empty set union together with the singleton set containing phi. And then again, I can move this over and introduce an um, implication. And that gives me then as a final step here that I have on the left-hand side of this turnstile symbol, I have the empty set, uh, which we can omit in our notation. And then on the right-hand side, I have the formula I wanted to prove. Okay, so that's two ways of establishing this sequence here. On the one hand, we can come up with a concrete example of a derivation in the natural deduction calculus, but we could also, again, use the sequent rules, which form sort of a sequent calculus in order to prove the sequence. Now, whenever in the exercises I'm asking you to prove certain sequence, the intention is that you write down a derivation like this in the natural deduction calculus, but you can also think about how you would do the corresponding thing using the sequent calculus. And then again, my tip is to work from the bottom up. This works very well for rules that don't mess with your assumptions. But here, in the case of implication, we see that it actually changes our state of assumptions. And therefore, we have to kind of reverse engineer the corresponding natural deduction rule. So whenever we work from the bottom up and use the introduction rule for implication, we introduce assumptions rather than removing them. This brings us to the elimination rule for implication, which is more straightforward. So it takes two derivations and produces a new one. So what types of derivations does it take? So first, we want a derivation that proves a formula phi based on some assumptions. And then second, we'll also want a derivation that proves the implication phi implies psi based on some other assumptions. So if these two things are derivations, then we can combine them and eliminate the implication. So how does that work? So we just put these two derivations like side by side, and then we eliminate the implication in the following way. So we have phi, and we also have phi implies psi, and therefore we conclude that psi holds. So this is nothing but the modus ponens rule that we saw in the video on informal proof theory. It says exactly the same thing. If we know that a statement phi holds, and also that this statement implies some other statement, then we get to conclude that other statement. Now here in this uh, larger derivation that we get from the elimination rule, we combine the assumptions. So if we can prove phi from the assumptions gamma, and also we can prove this implication from 
the assumptions delta, then in fact we have a proof of psi from the assumptions that live in both gamma and delta, so the union of these assumptions. The sequent rule that corresponds to this is the following. So if we know that this sequent is correct, namely that gamma entails phi, and we also know that delta entails that phi implies psi, then in fact we know that this sequent is correct, namely that the union of the assumptions entails psi. So that's just uh, basically this rule here reformulated in the language of sequence. As an example that uses this elimination rule, we consider the following sequent, which we want to prove. So we're allowed to use as assumptions that phi implies psi, and separately that psi implies chi, and what we want to prove is that then phi implies chi. So this is uh, expressing transitivity of this implication. Now again, a good idea is to start from the bottom. So we want to prove this formula here, and now we notice that the main connective occurring here is this implication, so probably the last step is this introduction rule for implication, and we would introduce here this uh, new uh, statement phi. So in fact, in this case, I could have assumed phi in addition to these other assumptions, and then, well, gotten rid of it in this last step. Okay, what remains if I, like, move upwards would be the statement chi. And now how do I get chi? Well, there are many possible ways you could come up with a proof of chi, but we have to consider here what uh, assumptions we have. So the thing I can observe is that here I have this implication that psi implies chi. Okay, so if I somehow would be able to prove psi, then together with this implication here, I could use the elimination rule for implication to obtain just chi by itself. So this train of thought creates a sub-goal of proving psi. Okay, how would I go about proving psi? Well, I have this other assumption here which says that phi implies psi, and now I'm allowed to additionally assume that phi holds. So I can combine these two assumptions using the elimination rule for implication to conclude that in fact psi holds. Okay, so this thing here is a valid derivation based on these assumptions. And now I can combine my knowledge that psi holds together with this additional assumption that psi implies chi. Again, using the implication elimination rule. And this will then give me a derivation of chi, which I can then use this introduction rule on to get that phi implies chi. And well, in this uh, step here, I've eliminated this assumption phi, and this means that this overall derivation here only uses these two assumptions, which is precisely what I wanted. All right, so here we see an example where I couldn't just like work directly from bottom to top. Somehow here in this step, it wasn't quite clear what the, the proper thing was to do because there wasn't any connective present here. But in this case, somehow I could reason out like what I would have to do to get to the point where I can actually derive um, chi. Now since we saw exactly this proof in the previous video on informal proof theory, let me read out this proof in words. So um, if we would write this down, we would say, suppose that phi holds, well then because phi implies psi, we conclude that psi holds. Now moreover, because by assumption psi implies chi, we conclude that chi holds, therefore we can conclude overall that phi implies chi, and we no longer will need this assumption of phi because that was like a temporary assumption we made in our argument. Okay, so if you want, you can read out these derivations sort of in the style of a uh, proof in natural language, and that's actually why the system is called natural deduction, because it mirrors the way that mathematicians usually write proofs. So another thing you can do if you're having trouble finding the correct derivation is you can actually try to write out a proof using the proof rules from the previous video and using words, and then you can try to convert that proof into a natural deduction derivation, and because the rules are basically the same, that shouldn't provide any problems. Okay, this brings us to some exercises that combine the rules we've seen so far. So here in this first part, you're asked to prove the following three sequence, which I suggest you try on your own. The second part is again more conceptual, so it asks you to show that the singleton set containing phi entails the formula psi if and only if we can actually prove this uh, 
formula here that uh, phi implies psi based on no assumptions. So again, here you have to assume that this sequent is correct and then show that in fact also this sequent is correct and show the converse as well that if this one is correct, then this is correct. Now the content of this is actually pretty interesting because it's saying that whenever you have like a single assumption that entails some statement, you can actually equivalently express this as saying you have no assumptions, but you're proving an implication. So another way of viewing this is saying that the implication in our logic somehow internalizes this entailment here, which is like a, a thing that's not part of our logic. If you remember from the previous exercise on uh, conjunction, there we said that whenever we have multiple assumptions, we can somehow bundle them together into a single assumption, and that's equivalent for like expressing things in terms of sequence. And now here I'm saying that whenever I have a single assumption, I can actually get rid of it by expressing the conclusion in terms of an implication. So taken together, this in fact shows that any sequent can equivalently be expressed as a sequent with no assumptions, which has like a big conjunction as its uh, premise, and then you have an implication to whatever the conclusion is. So if the previous exercise with the conjunction showed that you don't actually have to allow for multiple assumptions, you can just have a single one. Here, this one is saying that, in fact, you can have the same sort of expressiveness if you don't allow for any assumptions at all. You just uh, put everything in the big implication uh, in the formula you're trying to prove. We now move on to the next connective, which is the equivalence, if and only if. And here, basically, the rules are, again, the same as for the informal proof rules I gave you in the previous video. And they use the fact that this equivalence here is itself the same as having two implications in both directions. And that's precisely what's being expressed in this introduction rule here. So it's saying that if we have a derivation that manages to prove the implication from phi to psi, given the assumptions in gamma, moreover, we have a second derivation which proves the implication in the opposite direction, so that psi implies phi based on some other assumptions, delta, then, in fact, we can put these two derivations side by side and use the introduction rule for this uh, if and only if to conclude that phi if and only if psi. And again, the assumptions for this new derivation are the union of the individual sets of assumptions we had. Now, if you compare this rule to conjunction introduction, you'll see that it's exactly the same. So there we also have two derivations of two formulas, and then, well, we get a derivation of their conjunction. So if you would use that rule for introduction of conjunction, you would get that uh, as a resulting formula, you would get uh, that uh, phi implies psi and psi implies phi. And well, this is exactly what this thing here means. So this introduction rule for if and only if is exactly the same as the conjunction introduction rule because this formula is essentially the same as this one. So if you want, you can just think about this as being sort of a uh, renaming here of this formula. Thinking about this in that way should also explain the elimination rule. So if we have some derivation of phi if and only if psi from some assumptions delta, then we can get like the individual implication directions if we want. So given a derivation like this, we can uh, well, reduce this if and only if statement to a simple implication in one direction or the other direction. And we get to choose which direction we get. And again, if you think about this thing as actually being the same as the conjunction of both implications, like this, then, well, this rule here is basically just the elimination rule for conjunction, which is saying you get to forget about one of the conjuncts. And the other rule is the, the second one, which forgets about the other conjunct. But to remember these rules, just remember that to prove an if and only if, you have to prove both implications. And if you have an if and only if, then you get to conclude either implication. This already brings me to the next series of exercises, which you can try for yourself. So the first one asks you to write down sequent rules for this if and only if, so for the introduction and the elimination rule. So remember that previously, whenever I introduced a natural deduction rule, I gave a corresponding sequent rule. So here I haven't done so, and you can try for yourself to come up with sequent rules that correspond to these natural deduction rules. Then the second block of exercises here um, asks you to prove certain sequents that involve 
uh, this equivalence operator. And finally, the third point here is sort of a, a different style of exercise. So it says that, well, if we were to define a relation between uh, these statements, so we say that two statements are equivalent precisely when we can establish the equivalence phi if and only if psi from no assumptions. So if we make this definition of a relation on all uh, set of statements, then you're asked to show that this is in fact an equivalence relation. So in particular, you need to show that every uh, statement is equivalent to itself. And well, using our definition here, this would mean, for instance, that you have to prove that uh, from no assumptions, you can prove phi if and only if phi for all statements phi. In fact, that's exactly what uh, point B here is asking you to do. And then further, we have to prove that this relation is symmetric. So if phi is equivalent to psi, then also psi is equivalent to phi. And similarly, we need to show transitivity. So if phi is equivalent to psi and psi is equivalent to chi, then you need to show that phi is equivalent to chi. Okay, we now move on to the second to the last of the connectives, which is negation. And here already in the video on informal proof theory, we saw that the rules for negation were maybe a bit strange. This will be similar for natural deduction. So we'll start with the easier rule, which is the elimination rule. It says that if we have a derivation of uh, the statement phi, and we also have a second derivation of the statement not phi, well then if we combine these two derivations, uh, so we have some proof on the one hand of phi and also a proof of not phi based on the combined assumptions, well then we're allowed to conclude this absurdity here. So this is the symbol for absurdity or contradiction. So another way to think about this is that, in fact, these assumptions that we're making to start with are contradictory because from one part of the assumptions we can prove phi and from the other part of the assumptions we can prove its negation, and therefore we conclude an absurdity. On the other hand, the introduction rule for negation tells us how to use these absurdities that we're concluding. So suppose we have some derivation which um, derives an absurdity from some assumptions gamma. Then the introduction rule for negation is telling us that the following two things are also uh, derivations. So let's look at the first one. So the first one says that we can use the derivation as is, so the one we started with, but we remove a formula phi and we're allowed to conclude that in fact not phi. The second rule here is saying that removing phi in this process is optional, so in fact we could also leave phi in our set of assumptions if we wanted to. Okay, let's think about why this rule here makes sense. So suppose I have a derivation of absurdity based on some assumptions gamma. Well, what does this mean? Well, it means that these assumptions here are somehow contradictory, right? Because the only way I can get an absurdity is if I have, well, my assumptions here allow me to prove both a statement together with its negation. Now, since these assumptions here are contradictory, I can assume for any one of those assumptions that that assumption doesn't hold and I can remove it here from my set of assumptions. The reason this rule is a sound thing to do is the following. So suppose that phi is actually the assumption that causes the contradiction. Well, in that case, phi is not consistent with my remaining assumptions and therefore I can conclude that in fact phi cannot hold. So under the remaining assumptions that I have here, phi cannot hold. And that's exactly what this uh, rule here is concluding. On the other hand, it's possible that the remaining assumptions here are still contradictory, so would still pr produce an absurdity, and that phi wasn't actually alone in being the offending assumption. But in that case, if I have contradictory assumptions, I'm allowed to conclude any conclusion regardless, and so even in this case, I'm allowed to conclude that not phi is true. And that also explains this rule over here. So if I have some contradictory assumptions that produce an absurdity, well then I can conclude anything I like, including that not phi holds. So this application of the rule actually isn't doing anything to fix the problem of my inconsistent assumptions, whereas this rule might fix it if phi is actually the problem. On the other hand, if phi was not the problem, 
well then I could still derive a further absurdity from my remaining conclusions here and then I could like remove additional uh, problematic assumptions and eventually I would reach the point where actually I gotten rid of the problematic ones and the things that are are then proved are all correct because they're the negations of problematic things. Okay, so that's one way to think about this rule here. A second thing that might help to remember these rules is the following observation, namely that not phi, this statement, is somehow acting the same way as the statement phi implies the absurdity. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Well, I mean that this uh, formula here is somehow equivalent to this formula there. And this is similar to how the equivalence, so the if and only if arrow, was the same as conjoining two uh, separate implications. The intuitive meaning behind this is that phi being false is the same thing as saying that, well, if phi were true, then that would be absurd. So if phi being true is absurd, then in fact phi is false. So this is how these rules here are implicitly defining what this not phi actually means. I'll now show you how these rules are just the introduction and elimination rules for implication if we make this translation. For the first case, if we translate, we have that uh, we have some assumptions gamma and we manage to derive phi, and then d prime has some assumptions delta, and now we're translating not phi to be that phi implies absurdity, like this. And well now if we apply the elimination rule for implication, what we get is the absurdity, right? So the elimination rule for implication says that if we have uh, the sum statement and we have the implication that has that statement as hypothesis, then we can get rid of it and just conclude the conclusion, which in this case is absurdity. So that's exactly this uh, elimination rule for the negation. The only thing I've done is I've translated uh, this not phi here into this form of the implication with the absurdity. Okay, so far so good. Now for the second rule, so suppose I have a derivation of the absurdity based on some assumptions gamma. Well now I can use the introduction rule uh, for implication to conclude that phi implies the absurdity. Okay, and in this process, I'm also allowed to remove phi from my assumptions. So that was the introduction rule for implication. And here we see that if I now make the translation, so this thing is the same as not phi, well then that's exactly what this rule here is saying. So these two things are the same, apart from the fact that here I have not phi and here I have this implication. And again, as was the case for the introduction rule, it's not mandatory for me to remove this assumption. So that's what the second rule is saying, that I can also leave the assumption B if I wanted to, but uh, well, that would be somehow weaker. Okay, so like the rules for equivalence, these two rules are basically just old rules in disguise where we've somehow uh, rewritten certain combinations of connectives as new ones. Now let me use these rules to prove a sequent, uh, namely the following. So we want to prove this formula here from no assumptions, so it says that phi implies that not not phi. So somehow phi implies its double negation. Okay, so again here I'm going to start from the bottom. So here I have phi implies not not phi. And now I notice that the main connective of this formula is the implication. So the rule that probably applies here as the last rule is the introduction rule for the implication. So the formula I would have had before that would have been uh, this not not phi, okay? But also I would have been allowed to remove this uh, phi as an assumption. Okay, so here I put uh, phi as an assumption. And now I want to come up with a derivation of this formula here. So this thing is a negation, so probably in the last step I'm using negation introduction. So how do I introduce a negation? Well, somehow I have to have had, as the previous step, I have to have had this absurdity. So the previous step here should be an absurdity in order for me to use negation introduction. And well, in the course of using this introduction rule, I can also remove the unnegated version of the negation I'm deriving from my assumptions. 
So in this case, because it's a double negation, the unnegated thing that I can remove is actually not phi. So I might have additionally had the assumption of not phi, and now I see that, uh, in fact, things work out nicely because now the two assumptions that I'm allowed to use but remove in the course of the derivation are phi and not phi. And this is exactly the elimination rule for negation that allows me to conclude absurdity based on a statement and its negation. All right, so the proof in words would be, well, suppose that phi and not phi holds. Well, that would be absurd. Therefore, we conclude that it's not the case that not phi holds and well, because I suppose that phi holds, I can now conclude that phi implies that it's not the case that phi does not hold. So here in this step here, I've gotten rid of uh, this assumption, whereas in the second step here, I've gotten rid of this one. Unlike all the other connectives, negation actually has a third rule, namely reductio ad absurdum, or proof by contradiction, which is abbreviated RAA. So it looks very similar to the introduction rule for negation, but it sort of has the negation signs uh, flipped. So here we start again with a derivation of an absurdity based on some assumptions in the set gamma. And what RAA is telling me that, well, if I can derive an absurdity, then I get to conclude that phi holds, and I get to remove the negated version of phi from my assumptions. So if you compare this to the introduction rule for negation, there I had the, the negation occurring here, and I was just removing phi from my assumptions. Whereas here, I'm concluding phi and removing the negated version from my assumptions. Alternatively, I can not remove not phi from my assumptions, and that's also a valid application of the rule. Now, if we think about not phi as being somehow the same as phi implies absurdity, well, then we could like derive the previous two rules for negation based solely on the rules for implication. On the other hand, this is no longer the case for reductio ad absurdum. The reason being that, well, phi is no longer like an implication like this. So this is no longer like a case of the implication introduction rule. If you actually use the implication introduction rule in this setting, what you would get is that, well, you start with this derivation of absurdity from the set gamma, and well, now I want to, well, do implication uh, introduction. And so basically I want to do it in a way that I'm allowed to remove the uh, formula not phi from my assumptions. So in order to do this, I would actually have to have that not phi implies absurdity here. Okay. So that would somehow be the equivalent uh, situation if I used the implication introduction instead. And now using the translation I have for not phi in terms of phi implies absurdity, this formula here that I get is somehow the same as phi implies absurdity, implies absurdity, okay? But it turns out that if I don't assume reductio ad absurdum, so this rule here, I'm actually unable to prove that this thing is the same as just phi. We saw in the previous example that I can, without using proof by contradiction, I can show that the statement phi implies not not phi. So this follows from no assumptions. But in fact, the opposite implication that not not phi, like this implies that phi is true. In order to establish this sequence, you actually need to use this reductio ad absurdum rule. Now, the reason I'm elaborating on this here is that this topic actually is fairly important when you're looking at logic in a broader picture. So when you're defining a logic, you might ask whether you even want this type of behavior. And somehow here, this reductio ad absurdum again violates the constructivity of like things you're proving. So to illustrate this, so this thing here can be proved without uh, RAA, okay? And what is this statement saying? Well, it's saying that if phi is true, then it's absurd to assume that phi is not true. Okay, and so that somehow intuitively makes sense. So if something is true, then it doesn't also make sense to assume it's not true. On the other hand, this statement here, which you can only prove using this rule here is saying something different. It's saying that, well, if it's absurd to assume that phi is not true, 
well, then phi must in fact be true. So these two things are somehow qualitatively different. In this case, we're saying, okay, well, if the statement is true, well, then it doesn't also make sense to assume that it's not true. But here we're somehow going in the opposite direction. We're saying, well, it doesn't make sense to assume that the statement is false, and therefore it must be true. So somehow here we're getting like the truth of the statement for free based on the fact that it would be weird to assume that the statement is not true. But this means that this statement here is somehow non-constructive in the sense that, well, we've established the truth of this statement phi without having to have written down a proof for it. The only thing we needed to show in order to establish its truth in this case is that assuming its negation is absurd. On the other hand, we still don't know actually how to prove phi. So this is analogous to existence proofs that are either constructive or non-constructive in math. So suppose you're trying to prove that a certain object exists. Well, then either you can provide a, like a concrete recipe, so a construction of that object, and well, that would tell you how to make one. And in that case, obviously, you can conclude that such an object exists. On the other hand, the non-constructive proof would argue that it's absurd for such an object not to exist, and therefore it must exist. But the problem with that type of proof is that it gives you no idea how you would like get such an object, even though it should in principle exist. And well, from there, one can kind of go on to ask whether it even makes sense to talk about objects which supposedly exist, but which no one knows how to construct. In fact, there might even be such objects for which it's impossible to even in principle come up with a recipe on how to create them, but we're still somehow claiming that they exist because it's absurd for them not to exist. So that's somehow a weird situation where you have a thing which in principle can't be made, but you're somehow still saying that it exists. And a similar thing um, holds for logic here. So one could argue that if one can only prove a statement by arguing that its negation is absurd, then actually one hasn't really come up with a proof for that statement. And in fact, there are weaker forms of logic that don't make this assumption, so that don't have proof by contradiction. For example, intuitionistic logic, which rejects this proof by contradiction, and as a consequence, in intuitionistic logic, you can't actually uh, prove this statement here. Okay, so that was a bit of a digression on this proof by contradiction. So I think the take home message is that while the other two rules for negation basically follow by sort of translating the negation into an implication, um, this proof by contradiction actually like adds something to our proof calculus. And therefore there are cases where you can't get around using it if you want to prove uh, formulas, for example, like this one. However, the proof by contradiction method sort of produces convoluted proofs and therefore, uh, you probably would best avoid it if possible. But as I said, there are some cases where you can't avoid it. Let's now see how to prove this sequent not not phi implies phi using RAA. So here I want to prove this from no assumptions. So I'll start again from the bottom. So the formula I want to prove is not not phi implies phi, like so. And well, here I can see that the main connective is this implication. So probably in the last step, I will have used uh, implication introduction. And the thing that remains, well, before the introduction would just be phi, but I could have uh, gotten rid of this assumption here of not not phi, so I'm going to add that to my assumptions, like so. Now at this juncture, um, I've reduced my problem, so now I want to uh, derive phi based on not not phi. This might seem a bit tricky, but because I already know that I'm going to use RAA, well, this would be the point where I would have used it. So here the last step would be RAA. And well, for RAA to apply, I need to have derived a contradiction. And moreover, I can also, when using RAA, get rid of the negation of the thing I'm uh, deriving. So here, an additional assumption I could have had uh, would have been not phi. And now we see how this uh, contradiction arose. It's because I assumed not phi and also its negation not not phi. So this is now an instance of the elimination rule for negation. So whenever I have a statement together with its negation, then I can conclude an absurdity using the elimination rule for negation. Okay, so if I maybe make this a little more compact, that's uh, the complete derivation.
and well I just haven't said where I'm removing things so so in this first step here where I use RAA I'm getting rid of uh, this uh, assumption whereas in the second step where I'm using the introduction rule for implication I'm getting rid of this assumption now if I read out this argument in words we see that it's a bit convoluted so I would say suppose first that it's not the case that not phi holds now assume additionally that phi does not hold but that would be absurd so I conclude now that phi holds and therefore overall I've shown that not not phi implies phi so you can see that uh, this argument is a lot less basic than the one that was used to establish the opposite implication that phi implies not not phi which seemed more natural okay so now corresponding to these three rules for negation we also have the sequent rules the first rule is for negation elimination so it says that if uh, gamma entails phi and also delta entails that not phi then if we combine these hypotheses which produce these contradictory results then that entails an absurdity so that's precisely like the elimination rule in the natural deduction next here's the sequent rule for negation introduction so it says that if gamma together with the additional assumption of phi uh, produces an absurdity well then we get to uh, conclude that gamma alone entails that not phi to give the argument again why this makes sense if these assumptions together produce an absurdity then we know that some of these assumptions are inconsistent now it might be the case that phi is like the thing that's inconsistent with the rest of gamma and the rest of gamma actually is consistent well in that case well gamma would entail not phi because phi can't be correct under the assumption that everything in gamma uh, holds so in that case everything here is somehow coherent and we know that uh, phi cannot be true because if we add phi to this coherent set we get an incoherent one on the other hand it's possible that there are still inconsistencies here in gamma and phi isn't actually the problem well in that case these things are still inconsistent and would produce an absurdity but from absurdity we can conclude anything including uh, not phi so in that case also this uh, thing is correct so that's an intuitive explanation for why this rule makes sense but again we're here in the purely syntactic world so the definitions for these natural deduction rules are just that they're just definitions they aren't saying anything about the fact that the formulas we're producing actually are true or anything and also the sequent rules they just follow as a consequence of the corresponding natural deduction rules by the definition of what a sequent is expressing okay then the last uh, sequent rule we have for negation is RAA it's basically the same as the introduction rule for negation except that we've switched phi with not phi so if we have that gamma together with the assumption of not phi entails an absurdity then we get to conclude that gamma entails phi this brings me to some exercises which you can use to practice uh, these negation rules together with the rules we've already seen so far so the first block of four exercises here asks you to show the following sequence without using RAA so here I'm already telling you that you won't need to use RAA and then uh, the second exercise here asks you to prove one sequence for which you will need RAA so this sequence here is like the converse to uh, part C here so part C is saying that phi implies psi entails that not psi implies not phi so this is one direction of saying that uh, an implication is equivalent to its contrapositive and here in this exercise two we're proving the opposite direction so we're saying that the contrapositive implies the original implication we're now ready to turn to the final connective which is or so it will have one rule namely the introduction rule which is very simple and then we'll have a second rule the elimination rule which is more complicated but let's start with the easy case so the introduction rule says the following so if we have a derivation of the uh, statement phi based on the assumptions gamma well then we also can use that derivation to produce a derivation of phi or psi for any other statement psi based on the same assumptions 
So if I have a proof of phi based on assumptions gamma, then also I've proved phi or psi for any other statement psi based on the same assumptions. And similarly, I could also introduce the disjunction on the left. So if I prove phi based on the assumptions in gamma, I can also uh, conclude that psi or phi holds. So this is exactly the same as the rule I talked about in the video on informal proof theory. So basically, whenever we have proved a statement, we can always extend it with a disjunction because a disjunction is just saying that at least one of the components of the disjunction is true. All right, the corresponding rule for sequence is similar. So if at least one of the sequence is correct, so either we have uh, gamma entails phi or gamma entails psi, so at least one of these is correct, then the sequent gamma entails phi or psi is also correct. To give you an example of where this type of rule crops up, I'm going to prove the following innocent looking sequent, namely that we can derive that phi or not phi uh, holds from no assumptions. In fact, if you start thinking about this, proving this is way more difficult than you might expect. The reason again stems from this non-constructivity I was discussing before. So in fact, in order to prove this, we'll have to use proof by contradiction. The reason why this is non-constructive is, well, suppose that it's the case that either phi holds or it doesn't. Well, then if we know that it's not the case that phi does not hold, so we know that not not phi holds, then we can conclude that in fact phi holds. So this statement here, which is called the law of the excluded middle, in fact implies that not not phi implies phi. So this is another example of a statement which wouldn't hold in the intuitionistic logic I was talking about before, which rejects proof by contradiction and therefore also the uh, law of the excluded middle. Remember that an intuitionist would say that your statement is true if you can come up with a proof for it. In particular, a statement is false if you can come up with a proof that the statement is false or you can come up with a proof that shows that, well, assuming your statement is true would be absurd. But this leaves like some gray area. So this statement is saying like categorically that every statement is either true or false. Whereas in this view that in order to accept a statement as true, you need a proof for it. It's possible that there are certain statements for which there just aren't any proofs. So you could have a statement for which you can neither prove the statement itself nor its negation. In fact, even in classical logic, which assumes the law of the exclude middle and accepts proof by contradiction, as soon as your language gets sophisticated enough, basically as soon as you can do arithmetic in it, you can cook up statements for which you can show that you can neither prove nor disprove them. So that's basically uh, one thing that the Gödel's incompleteness theorem is saying. So in that case, you actually do get a divide between things that are considered to be true and things which are actually provable in principle. And at that point, it might be a valid question to ask, well, what does it mean for something to be true if you can't even in principle prove that it's true? So in the case I was talking before, you can actually see that the statement, which is in principle not provable, is actually true, but you can only see this like from outside your formal system. So somehow you know things about your statement which the formal system itself doesn't know about. And then in principle, you could somehow extend your system in order to make those types of statements again provable, but basically then new statements will result that are somehow seen to be true from outside your system, but which are not themselves provable inside the system. So in any case, I find all of this stuff very interesting to think about. Maybe you do too. This is something you would encounter if you go further uh, into mathematical logic, but it's not something I can really cover in this course. But maybe that digression will give you some idea of why this statement will be surprisingly difficult to prove. It has to do somehow with the non-constructive nature of it. Okay, so I'll now write down the derivation for the law of the excluded middle. And basically I'll just start by writing it down and then I'll comment on it because I don't think I can do both at the same time without making any mistakes. So there'll be basically two branches to this derivation. So in the first one, we assume that not phi holds. And well, then we use uh, the introduction rule for disjunction to conclude that, well, phi or not phi holds, like so. Now I'll introduce an additional assumption, 
namely that it's the case that the law of the excluded middle does not hold. So that it's not the case that phi or not phi holds. Okay, but this is clearly a contradiction because I'm assuming the negated version of what I had over there. So with the elimination rule for negation, I get to conclude an absurdity. Okay, but now using RAA, I conclude phi and get rid of the assumption that not phi holds. So because I got the contradiction here, one of my assumptions is wrong, and I'm assuming that this assumption is wrong, and I'm using uh, proof by contradiction, so I'm getting rid of the negated version of it. Now the second branch for this derivation is similar, so here I start with phi instead of not phi, and I conclude phi or not phi using the introduction rule for disjunction. Okay, and now again, I'm going to make this assumption that in fact it's not the case that phi or not phi holds, like so. From this, I can again conclude an absurdity using the elimination rule for negation. So I'll put that here on this side because I'm running out of space. And now I use the introduction rule for negation to conclude that in fact not phi is the case, and I get rid of this assumption phi here in this step. Okay, so let's take stock of what we've done. So here in this branch, I've used proof by contradiction to establish phi based on the assumption that the law of the excluded middle does not hold. So if you wanted to put this argument into words, you would say, well, suppose that the law of the excluded middle does not hold, and suppose further that phi does not hold. Well, then, um, because phi does not hold, so does phi or not phi, and this would be a contradiction, therefore phi must hold. And similar over here, I've managed to derive not phi based on the assumption that the uh, law of the excluded middle does not hold. So the argument in words would be, suppose that the law of the excluded middle does not hold, and now additionally, suppose that phi holds. Well, if phi holds, then phi or not phi holds. This is a contradiction, therefore not phi must hold. Okay, but now I have these two contradictory statements which I've derived, and I can now again use the uh, elimination rule for negation to get an absurdity based on these. And finally, I now use proof by contradiction to conclude that this assumption I had made, namely that the law of the excluded middle does not hold, is in fact responsible for this absurdity, and therefore I conclude that in fact the law of the excluded middle must hold. Like so. And in this step, I'm getting rid of both of these assumptions here. You might ask here why I'm allowed to get rid of both of these assumptions at the same time. So if you look at the rule, basically I was considering the set of assumptions and I was removing an element from that set. So because the set of assumptions here doesn't count this thing twice, I can remove both at the same time. But this is maybe something that isn't quite clear from the way I wrote the rule down. Okay, so maybe let's uh, give this argument here in words again. It's not going to make it less convoluted, but maybe we'll understand a bit better what's going on. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, suppose for the sake of contradiction that the law of excluded middle would not hold. Now, first suppose that not phi is additionally the case. Well, then I can conclude that phi or not phi, which is absurd. Therefore, in the case that the law of the excluded middle does not hold, I can conclude that phi holds. And in a similar argument, if the law of the excluded middle does not hold, and I assume phi, then that would be absurd. Therefore, also, not phi would have to hold if the law of the excluded middle did not hold. Therefore, if the law of the excluded middle does not hold, then both phi and not phi would be the case, which is absurd. Therefore, the law of the excluded middle must hold. So that's a pretty convoluted argument. Let's think about whether we could get rid of these uses of RAA. So actually, this use here is maybe superfluous because I could have, instead of using RAA, I could have used, again, the introduction rule for negation and concluded that not not phi is the case, and that would still produce an absurdity here. So this occurrence I could get rid of, but uh, this one I can't get rid of because here, in order to conclude that the law of the excluded middle holds based on my assumption that it does not hold, I have to use proof by contradiction.
if in fact I had just used uh, the introduction rule for negation, this whole thing would just prove that not, not the law of the excludal middle holds, meaning that it would be absurd to assume that it doesn't hold. But if you don't have proof by contradiction, that doesn't immediately imply that it in fact does hold. Okay, so there's an example to show you that seemingly simple statements can sometimes be uh, pretty tricky, and especially watch out for this type of uh, statement here if you encounter it and try to prove it. This brings us finally to the last rule for natural deduction without quantifiers. So here we're seeing the elimination rule for disjunction, and it is the most complicated rule so far because it uses three uh, derivations. Okay, so what is it saying? It's saying, suppose I have a derivation of a disjunction phi or psi based on some assumptions, and suppose that I have two further derivations of a statement chi based on different sets of assumptions. Then this rule is saying that I'm allowed to put these three derivations side by side, and overall they uh, derive the statement chi. So that's the statement that occurred twice here. Not only that, but I'm also allowed to remove assumptions. So in the first derivation here that proves chi, I'm allowed to remove phi, so that's the component here of this disjunction, and in the second uh, derivation here I'm allowed to remove psi from its assumptions. Again, removing things is optional, so the whole rule still goes through fine if I don't remove anything, but that's somehow you know, not using the rule to its full extent. Now at first glance this rule might seem incomprehensible, but basically it's expressing the same rule that I presented to you in the previous video on informal proof theory. So remember that in order to eliminate a disjunction, so in order to prove some consequence based on a disjunction, well we have to provide proofs from both of the components to the desired statement. So if I want to prove a statement chi based on this disjunction here, well first I need to assume that phi is in fact the component of the disjunction that's true, and then I prove chi based on that, and second I assume that psi is in fact the component of the disjunction that's true, and then I derive chi based on that. So if in either case I can prove chi, so regardless whether phi is true or psi is true, then in fact I can use this disjunction to prove chi overall. So if I write down this special case, so let's suppose we have a proof of phi or psi based on some assumptions gamma, and moreover I have a proof of chi based solely on the assumption um, phi, so that would be a derivation d prime, then d double prime would be a derivation of chi based on psi, well then what I have in total is a proof of chi but I no longer need these assumptions um, phi and psi. So this is similar to like when we did the implication rule, so getting rid of these assumptions is like saying that these assumptions were temporary, so in the informal proof I would say, okay, suppose first that phi is in fact true, then I can derive chi, and similarly suppose temporarily that psi is true, then I can in fact derive chi, and so overall chi is true, and these temporary assumptions, well these were just temporary so I get rid of them. So that's exactly what the elimination rule here is saying, just it's more general in that it allows some additional assumptions aside from just these single ones to occur, but I can't get rid of those additional assumptions um, by using this rule. Now here is a case where the secret rule actually looks simpler, so uh, the corresponding secret rule goes as follows, so suppose that both of these uh, sequence are correct, so on the one hand um, gamma unioned with phi entails chi, and on the other hand delta unioned with uh, psi entails also chi. Well in that case, if I combine the assumptions gamma and delta together with a disjunction uh, phi or psi, then that overall entails chi. So if you think about the special case here where gamma and delta are the empty set, then this is saying that, well, if I can derive chi based on phi and also I can derive chi based on psi, then I can derive chi based on uh, the disjunction phi or psi, which makes sense because here in this disjunction I'm not sure which one of the two uh, statements is actually correct.
And then, well, these additional assumptions here, they just need to be combined so that we have access to them in this uh, final proof. Now here, since the uh, sequent rule looks a bit different than the natural deduction rule, you might treat it as an exercise to actually prove this sequent rule based on this natural deduction rule. So you would assume that both these sequents are correct, which means that there are certain derivations of uh, specific forms, and then you have to come up with a derivation that proves that this sequent is correct. Perhaps the best way to get used to the complicated elimination rule for disjunction is just to practice a bunch. So here are some exercises. So the first set of exercises here does not require the elimination rule for disjunction, but you are proving some things about disjunction, so you'll need to be using uh, the introduction rule. On the other hand, the second grouping here does require the use of the elimination rule for disjunction, and the way to go about this, I would suggest, is just to think about this sort of proof by cases idea I gave to you in the video on informal proof theory. So I think most of these statements here are actually fairly intuitive once you think about what they mean. For instance, uh, C here is saying, well, if you know that phi or psi is the case, and also you know that it's not the case that phi holds, well, then you get to conclude that psi holds. That's in fact an example I believe we saw in the previous video. And so if you're struggling with the formal natural deduction, you might first try to come up with a proof in words that uh, uses the proof rules I described there, and then you can try to translate it into a natural deduction proof. All right, with that, I'm done with what I wanted to present in this video. So basically, I've given you all of the rules for natural deduction aside from the rules for quantifiers. So in principle now, you can prove any sort of statement in propositional logic using natural deduction if you wanted to. By now, you've probably figured out whether you're the type of person who enjoys writing down these types of natural deduction proofs. If you are, well, then I hope you've enjoyed solving these exercises. And uh, you might actually use this uh, in future if you ever want to like establish certain logical equivalences and so on. In contrast to like writing down a proof in words, this is a very compact way to establish these types of formulas. On the other hand, if you're not the type of person who enjoys this sort of thing, then the main takeaway from this video should be that we now have like a completely formal system that tells us what a proof is. So a proof is a certain type of derivation which follows certain given rules. And based on this completely syntactic object, we can now establish a proof theory that relates what types of uh, statements we can prove with like their truth value. So in contrast to the informal proofs I was talking about in the previous video, where it's completely not clear what all the rules are exactly for writing down a proof, so there's going to be language in there, so like which words are we allowed to use and which ones aren't we allowed to use, and does that somehow affect the outcome of the proof or not? Like those are all questions that we can't really answer if we don't say precisely what a proof is. Now we have this system which completely describes what we accept as a proof, and now we can start like proving things about the system itself. So that's where we'll be headed in the next um, videos. So we'll be using this system to think about propositional logic from a more formal standpoint, and we'll also show that in fact, this system is like a good proof system. So um, the formulas it gives us are actually going to turn out to be valid. And conversely, any valid formula in propositional logic can be established using the system.